talks about his journey to pursue happiness <laughs> and look at the inside. This book really is gorgeous. With his mother, his abuela, and Coco. When I read that, it made me think of how I would define my homeschool life if it was a genre. And I think magical realism would certainly be it. We are the Falco family. Brian, Serena, Cameron, Kendall, and Savannah, a family of filmmakers exploring the truth about education. Learning to document our adventures in homeschool and life and tell stories of how we live and what we learn. Welcome back or welcome to our channel. It's Serena from the Falco family where we make videos about education and lifestyle. So today I'm back with another book haul, friends. I am hauling through our bookshelves because I'm curious about what's on other people's bookshelves. So I feel like other people may be curious about what is on our bookshelves. So first up, I try to uh, sort through my sections by genre, but sometimes it's a whole mess. Um, I'm gonna start with the non-fictions that we have on the list today. The first one I have is Permission to Dream by Chris Gardner. This is the author of The Pursuit of Happiness. You guys know that this was a very popular movie with Will Smith. It talks about his journey to pursue happiness, to go after the American dream. So um, I'm really excited about having this. This is One Winter Day. Chris Gardner took his granddaughter, Brooke, to find the harmonica of her dreams. During the trip, the two became stranded on the south side of Chicago, where Chris, removed from his comfortable environment, explained to the young girl how he went from being a homeless single father to being a wealthy man. In sharing his story, he recognized how powerful dreaming can be at every stage of development, and that we need to tap into this mindset to achieve a life of happiness and reward. The goal is to shape your life into a masterpiece, which will allow you wealth untold, whether intellectually, spiritually, or financially, to share with others. Dreams aren't just to improve your life, but to make the world better. Permission to Dream is an enthralling story about turning dreams into action beginning right now. I feel like this is something I really want to have on our shelves because um, it's just great to talk through other people's um, advice going after dreams in life and just being able to identify the parts and pieces that resonate with you and your family and things that maybe you would want to tweak or um, identify why you don't necessarily see them or shape them in that way if that makes any sense I can talk more about this in a future video I feel like because I have so much more to say about it but um, I do really like to walk through people's journeys and how they feel like feel they achieved happiness and how they've defined happiness. So this one is permission to dream. I guess this I don't know. I thought it was more of a nonfiction. I don't know if it is or if it is fiction. I'm not sure. I guess we'll figure it out. The next one I have, I know, I think it's fiction too, not non-fiction too, um, and I don't know how to say this well, so A True Story of Belonging in America. So Sarah is a middle schooler from Brooklyn, New York. Um, when she first joined the after-school program at Still Waters in a Storm, Sarah was quiet and shy. Now Sarah translates and adapts famous stories, writes songs, and has the lead role in a play, The Traveling Serialized Adventures of Kid Quixote. I don't know why I can't say that well. Um, like most 10 year olds, Sarah loves being a regular kid, but through her experiences traveling and performing with the Kid Quixotes, did I say it right? Sarah has found her voice and she will inspire you to imagine to speak up and to sing out. We are also, along with our writing years and our homeschool life, really focusing on public speaking. And I feel like this is gonna be a good example to add to the mix about how you practice more and how your voice really begins to come out. So excited to read this one with the kids. Next up, I have another, pretty sure it's a nonfiction, Greta's story, the school girl who went on strike to save the planet. You are never too young to make a difference. So since she learned about climate change, Greta couldn't understand why politicians weren't treating it as an emergency. In August 2018, temperatures in Sweden reached record highs. Forest fires raged across the country and 15 year old Greta decided to stop waiting for political leaders to take action. Instead of going to school one Friday, she made a sign and went on strike in front of Stockholm's parliament building. Um, so her protest grew into the global Fridays for Future or School Strike for Climate movement. 
which millions have joined now. Um, I think that these types of stories are really important in our homeschooling lives because we are always really big on telling our kids to be different, telling them to stand up, telling them to use their voice. And somehow when kids do, <laughs> they end up um, being scrutinized. And I think that's just something we have to like explore more and really um, consider what we are doing. Are we sending the same message? Are we practicing what we preach? Are, encur are we encouraging you know, what we propose? So I'm excited to read more. You guys have seen this one before. We have a couple of these in our um, library. This is The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. This is a nonfiction. Kendall always corrects me on this. William Kakwamba. I'm pr hopefully it's right. Um, and Brian Miller. Uh, so this is the story of a young man in Africa who used the only resources available to him to build a windmill and elevate the li lives and spirits of those in his community. Um, Kokwamba's achievements with wind energy should serve as a model of what one person with an inspired idea can do to tackle the crisis we face. This story is just so good. <laughs> um, there are a few things in it that Maybe, I mean, in any book, there are things that you might want to skip past if your kids are not ready for or, you know, that's always a thing. So that's something you should always be looking for when you lay out something for your kids to read. Um, but this story, <laughs> I won't go too far into it now, but I just really love it. It's, it's to me, um, all about reshaping your mind to understand what it is to be educated and what that path could look like and really being purposeful in your pursuits in education. So, and how many resources you actually need? Like what is the ultimate like resource that you truly need and things that you need to be instilled in you along your journey to education? When Stars Are Scattered, this is a graphic novel that my younger son really loves. I haven't read it yet. This is a story about Omar and his younger brother, Hassan, and they've spent most of their lives um, in a refugee camp in Kenya. Um, it's hard there, never enough food, achingly dull, no access to medical care. Um, his brother is nonverbal. So when Omar has the opportunity to go to school, he knows it might be a chance to change the future, but it would also mean leaving his brother. Um, it's about heartbreak and hope and gentle humor, they said, exist in this graphic novel about childhood uh, spent waiting and a young man who's able to create a sense of family and home in the most difficult of settings. Um, it's an intimate, important, unforgettable look at the day-to-day -day life of a refugee. Again, there's stuff inside of these stories I feel like most people are just maybe not tapping into as they should and gathering what all of what is there because for me when I read stories like this it really helps you to redefine what is necessary to create a thing like what is necessary to establish a well-rounded true education or what is necessary to establish family um, for instance so for me these refugee and finding family stories really help me to get back to the basics of what is actually required to build familiness and memories and a lot of times it's not so much all of the extra resources and fluff we like to add to things so anyway that was a tangent <laughs> but we have wind stars are scattered by victoria jameson and omar maham book one <laughs> in the uh, mighty meg and the magical ring i wanted to have a whole collection of these again they were just those kind of books that are so quick and easy for them to get through that before you know it, you know, they've read through them all from the library and you haven't gathered them all to add to your collection. So um, just nice and fantastical. Meg's life is turned upside down when a magical ring gives her superpowers, but she isn't the only one who changes. Strange things are starting to happen. Um, and now Meg must use her brand new powers to keep everyone safe. Super cute. Uh, little series of stories that I would like to have a whole collection of. Next up is another one of my big collection of books. If you guys have read these, please shed some light because I've seen so many of these like volumes. This one is volume four. And when I got it, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if this is one through four. It says complete collection. I don't know. I've just seen so many of them and I'm like, well, how many collections are there? Anyway, this is Dr. Doolittle's volume four, the complete collection. This has Dr. Doolittle in the moon, Dr. Doolittle's return, Dr. Doolittle and the secret lake. And then there's Gub Gub's book. 
I don't know. Um, but this, <laughs> this is about a doctor who has is eccentric national naturalist who can speak with the animals. These have been classics in children's literature for a century. They have now been assembled in a four volume collection fully updated for the modern reader by the author's son. That's really interesting. Anyway, I'm excited to read through these with the kids and see what we make of them. Um, and I would love to know if you've read through them yourself. Next up, I have The Tree of Eckhoff. This is one of the books. I don't know if this is considered a series. I don't know. This is the only one that we have that they haven't read just yet. Um, this is created by Kobe Bryant and written by Ivy Claire. This book is beautiful, you guys. Look at the cover. <laughs> And look at the inside. Do you see these rainbow pages, friends? And it even has a bookmark. A book ribbon, bookmark ribbon, which we love to see it. And look at the tree. This book really is gorgeous. So um, this is set in an alternate classical world dominated by sports and a magical power called Grana. Um, Apaka, the tree of Igroff is the story of two children, the orphan outcast Rovi and the crown princess Preta, <laughs> Pratia or Preta, who uncover and battle terrible evil and discover their inner strength along the way. Can I just tell you that the things that Kobe Bryant created are, have so many lessons inside of them. Currently, Cameron is, or Brian has built um, somewhat of a basketball strengthening uh, curriculum that he is working his way through currently. And a lot of Kobe's works are a part of that curriculum. And it's just been so good. He just has such a way with being able to um, adapt lessons and really pull out all of the lessons in life using sports and other things so anyway this book <laughs> we haven't read this one yet but we do have three other in the series again they're not quite the same stories but i'm still going to call them series for this purpose um but we love having these as a part of our library next up i have the big full color collector's edition of the one and only ivan uh you guys this book such a special place in our heart and it's one of those stories that's like, when I read through it, I was like, what is actually happening? <laughs> but I feel like that happens a lot. Kids will really hold on to stories that you're like, did we love that? Or, <laughs> I don't know. This is about Ivan. He's a gorilla. And it says, it's not as easy as it looks. This edition is beautiful. It's, it's so pretty. It has full color lots of big words it's just a beautiful book for the kids to have author of sarah plain and tall says quite simply this story is life-changing i don't know if it changed my life but we liked it <laughs> so i'm excited to read this later on with a different lens and see if we could pull out some extra things but this is the copy that we have of the one and only ivan next up i have a series of classics I think they would be considered by Roald Dahl. Um, I have Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Roald Dahl's Fantastic Mr. Fox. His Georgia's Marvelous Medicine. And James and the Giant Peach. Um, again, the goal for me in classics is to have them added to our collection so we can really dive in and assess the times. Literature is an interesting thing. A lot of the things that are included in certain bodies of work would not pass for this time period. And I feel like I got a lot of those vibes reading Roald Dahl. He has a lot of ways of um, writing and expressing things that are questionable, <laughs> but fun nonetheless. So um, we like having them as a part of our library. So next up, I have Jean Birdsall's The Penderwicks at Last. I think this is the second book in the series. Oh, yes. Hold on, friends. Okay, so this is the first book, The Penderwicks, a summer tale of four sisters, two rabbits, and a very interesting boy. 
So um, I actually don't know too much of what it's about other than what I just read to you. <laughs> this is actually um, one of the read alouds that was um, executed by Brian. So every now and then Brian jumps in for a read aloud and this is what he read to them. They enjoyed the story. I don't think it was fantastic for them, but they did enjoy the story. And the next one that we have is the Penderwicks at last. And I think there might be two more or three more. You guys let me know. I think there's three more left in this series that I hope to collect. And then we can go back through and look with a critical lens down the line in more literature studies. So the next one I have is When I Hit the Road. This is one they picked up during a summer visit to the library. So I'm not exactly sure what it's about. Samantha is not exactly excited to spend two whole weeks of her summer vacation in Florida condominium complex with her gram. Um, or to have to write Dear Me letters to her future self. But it turns out that Graham has some not so boring plans up her sleeve. Graham wants to sing in the Seniors Got Talent karaoke contest and her new best friend Mimi is coming along for the ride. Um, so they're going through the back roads of South Florida in Graham's new Mustang and it turns into a series of hilarious mishaps that flip Samantha's summer on its head, especially when she has to share the back seat with a mystery guest who makes her cringe from head to toe. It looks like her Dear Me letters might be worth keeping after all because this summer will be one of Samantha's, um, one that Samantha will never want to forget. We love a good multi-generational story. We love a good road trip story. So excited to see what this one is about. Next up, I have um, The Boy at the Back of the Class. A little kindness goes a long way. On the third Tuesday of the school year, a new kid arrives in Miss Khan's class. I'm a Syrian refugee. Everyone is curious about the newcomer, especially since he never smiles and doesn't talk much either. Still, one student is determined to become his friend and learns that standing up for others has the incredible potential to change an entire community for the better. This story encourages kindness and reminds readers that everyone deserves a place to call home. I think refugee stories are my favorite <laughs> because it really taps in to you being open to people's differences and um, being a contributor to them finding place to call home. So now I have Lucky Broken Girl by Ruth Behar. Ruthie moves with her family from her homeland of Cuba. I really try really hard to find representation of different places um, so that they can head to our globes and to our maps to figure out where in the world these characters, um, these protagonists are. So this is another one I get to add to my list. Um, set in Cuba. Uh, to the bustling streets of New York is a lot to take in. New sights, new sounds, a new language, but Ruthie is adjusting. She's already mastering English and has made some new friends. But then Ruthie's in a car accident and she ends up in a body cast that stretches all the way from her chest to her toes. Just when she was starting to feel like life in New York would be okay, now she has to lie in bed for months and be treated like a baby again. All kinds of interesting people start visiting, bringing stories and gifts, and suddenly she starts to feel like everything might be okay after all. So excited to read this one. Next up is Finding Wonders. I originally thought this was a nonfiction. I don't think it is, <laughs> but um, I think it is a, let's see. I think this is actually kind of historical fiction and it weaves together the stories of different change makers um, in science. So this is Finding Wonders, Three Girls Who Changed Science. Maria wondered how caterpillars turned into beautiful creatures with wings. Through careful observation, which she learned from her father as he painted, she discovers the truth about metamorphosis and documents um, her findings in gorgeous paintings of the life cycles of insects. Um, a century later, Mary helped her father collect stone sea creatures from the cliffs in the southwest England. To him, they were a source of income, but to Mary, they held a stronger fascination. Um, she would eventually discover that fossils would change people's vision of the past. Then across the Atlantic, Maria helped her map make her father in the whaling village of Nantucket. At night, they explored the star starry sky through his telescope. Maria longed to discover a new comet, and after years of study in the night sky, she did. Uh, so this is actually told in verse, and it's the story of three remarkable girls who found wonder in the world around them. Next up, I have um, Midsummer's Mayhem by Rajani LaRocca. 
Vanna's already read this one and I'm a little bit behind. I've read through part of it and <laughs> need to finish it up so we can chat things out with her. 11 year old Mimi comes from a big Indian American family. The youngest of four, she feels invisible, but her dream of proving herself seems possible when she enters a baking contest in a bakery in town. But Mimi's dad, a renowned food writer, mysteriously loses his highly home sense of taste. She worries she'll never be able to bake something impressive enough to propel her to gastronomic fame. Um, she struggles with what to make. She's drawn into the woods behind her house where she meets a boy who shows her parts of the forest she's never seen, who knew there were banyan trees and wild boars in Massachusetts. Together they discover exotic ingredients and bake them into delectable and enchanting treats. But as her dad acts stranger every day and her siblings' entanglements cause her trouble, Mimi begins to wonder whether the ingredients she and Vic found are somehow behind it all. She uses her skills, deductive and epicurean, to try to uncover the truth. In the process, she learns that in life, as in baking, not everything is sweet. Next up, I have the water bears. So Newt has a thing with bears. He survived a bear attack and um, he finds an unusual bear statue that might grant wishes. His best friend notices a wishbone on the statue and decides to make a wish. And when it comes true, he thinks it's, Newt thinks it's a coincidence. Um, even as more people wish on the bear and their wishes come true, he's not convinced. Uh, but he has a wish too. He loves his home on eccentric Murphy Island and he wants to go to middle school on the mainland. Uh, where his extended family lives. He's not the only Latin ex kid. He won't have to drive the former taco truck, a gift from his parents, and he won't have to perform in the talent show. Most importantly on the mainland, he never has had bad dreams about the attack, and he's almost ready to make his secret wish where everything changes. There's themes of survival and self-acceptance, um, and this illuminates the magic in our world where reality is often uncertain, but always full of salvageable wonders. I love that last line so very much. <laughs> and honestly, when I read that, it made me think of how I would define my homeschool life if it was a genre. And I think magical realism would certainly be it. So, um... Yeah, excited to read this one. I think two of my kids have read it already, but I'm excited to read it for myself. The next one I have is The Toothpaste Millionaire. I've heard really good things about this one. They don't like to pick it up because they think that the illustration is a little bit um, creepy, and I get that. <laughs> so this is about a sixth grader, Rufus Mayflower. He doesn't set out to become a millionaire. He just wants to save on toothpaste. Betting he can make a gallon of his own for the same price, um, as one tube from the store, he develops a step-by-step -step production plan with help from his good friend. Uh, by the time he reaches the 8th grade, Rufus makes more than a gallon, he makes a million. These books are always great. Books where the storyline is that a kid has an idea and a kid acts on that idea. And I love that for them. So I'm excited to, I might just have to pick this up and read through it myself to them as a read aloud because it seems like they are having a hard time picking it up off the shelf. Next up, I have The Bridge Home. Bisha Saeed is the author of A Mall Unbound, which we also have. She says, readers will be captivated by this beautifully written novel about young people who must use their instinct and grit to survive. Um, she shares, the author shares an unflinching peak unflinching peek into the reality of millions of homeless children living every day but also infuses her story with hope and bravery that will inspire readers and stay with them long after turning the final page. So again I don't know much more than that but I'm excited to read it. This I know I have the second book in this series. I think there's maybe three or four in this series but this is the first one. Um, Winter House, A Lavish Hotel, A Family Secret, A Book of Puzzles, and A Veil of Magic. That's all I needed to know. <laughs> Okay, so Orphan Elizabeth Summers, malevolent Aunt Purdy, and Uncle Burlap ship her off to the ominous Winter House Hotel. Owned by a peculiar no bridge, nor bridge falls, upon arrival, she quickly discovers that Winter House has many charms, most notably its massive library. That pretty much added it to my cart on its own. Um, it's not long before she locates a magical book of puzzles that will unlock a mystery involving Norbridge and his sinister family. But as she uncovers the hotel's secrets, Elizabeth starts to realize that somehow she is connected to Winter House for better or for worse. So mystery, adventure, beautiful writing, um, an exciting debut set within the hotel full of secrets. So, and we love a good book that we can continue along with and see how things go. So we have Winter House.
Okay, and last but not least, I have my little stack of picture books that I can go through here. Um, the first one I have is Across the Bay. This is a story about old San, San Juan. Carlitos lives in a happy home with his mother, his abuela, and Coco the cat. Life in his hometown is cozy as can be, but the call of the capital city pulls Carlitos away um, across the bay in search of his father. This book, you know, picture books, I feel like I can do a whole different video on how to how to <laughs> address picture books because they're not all created equal. There are some picture books that have really rich stories. There are some picture books that are like the illustrations do all the talking. And then there are some picture books that you have to reach a little bit deeper to figure out how you can use them um, in your everyday homeschool life is I think what I'm trying to say. So I would love to do a video that talks a little bit more about that because sometimes when you show a book um, it's not like an incredible story and I feel like that's what this was for me. It's not one of those incredible stories that just kind of stand alone but it's something that you have to add a little extra something to that makes it rich and makes you or helps you to appreciate it even more. I hope that makes sense. But this one is Across the Bay. The next one I have is Parker Looks Up, An Extraordinary Moment by Parker Curry and Jessica Curry, illustrated by Brittany Jackson. So uh, when Parker Curry came face to face with Amy Sherald's transcendent portrait of First Lady Michelle Obama, she saw dynamic self-assurance, she saw truth and beauty, she saw a queen. But most importantly, Parker saw her hopes, her dreams, her power, her promise, herself. Yeah, such a sweet moment, such a sweet beautiful story and then the next one I have is Evelyn El Evelyn Evelyn <laughs> why does my tongue want to get stuck Evelyn no Evelyn Evelyn Del Rey is moving away this is by Meg Medina who is the author of Mercy Suarez Changes Gears and Mercy Suarez Can't Dance um, but this clearly is about Evelyn Del Rey um, is Daniela's best friend, her mejor amiga. But after today, everything will be different. After today, Evelyn won't live in a mirror image apartment across the street. Um, she's moving away. The two girls spend one last afternoon together in Evelyn's apartment playing among the boxes until the apartment is empty and it's time to say their goodbyes. They promise to, they promise to visit and keep in touch and though they will be apart, they know they will always be each other's first best friend, their numero uno. This is gonna be sweet. <laughs> Okay, and that is all I have for you for this book haul today. Um, yeah, let us know all the bookish stuff in the comment section below. Uh, do you have any of these? Have you read any of these? Are any of these on your list of things that you've been looking out for? Just let us know all the things. Thanks so much for watching. Remember that life is so very full of lessons and our goal, as always, is to live and to learn. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe.